Well, it's good to be back at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. I love this place. Glad my family got to come. Of course, it was either bring them or not come myself. So, no, I'm glad they got to come. And it's uh, obviously a, a little bit more of a chore to drive, but the Lord gave us safety Monday and uh, getting here. And I do thank God for his goodness and uh, just all that's going on. I love you, Pastor. Thank God for Brother J.D., Miss Doreen, and his children, and just what a blessing they are to us. And then to the former pastor, Brother Willette, and Miss Chrissy, just dear friends, and thank God for the influence both of these men have been in my life. And then just, I was thinking today, just all the friends and just the, the preachers here, Brother Cowling, and the closeness we share. I just thank God for putting this place in our path and in our life and excited for the days ahead. I know it's different days. Um, we, uh, we're... Uh, really, I guess, even a little bit more stricter in our state than what they're requiring y'all to be, and it's been a, a little difficult, but the Lord's helped us and blessed us, and I'm excited about what God's going to do. I want you to open your Bibles tonight to the book of Exodus chapter number 4, Exodus chapter number 4, and um, I don't know that this has happened before, but I was uh, been praying and studying and had to, it wasn't a matter of what to preach, it was a matter of just trying to find the mind of God. And about everything I was praying about was things that I've preached recently in the last couple of months. I usually try to stay fresh if the Lord will let me in that when I preach out. But um, I preached this a little bit ago and uh, enough that I've preached a whole lot since then, especially doing devotions on Facebook and everything for our church. And uh, I looked at it today, prayed over it, spent some time praying, felt like it was uh, prayed over what to preach and then got ready and got here and got up on the platform and started flipping through my Bible for my notes for it <clears throat> and I don't know where they're at <laughs> and um, I uh, they're somewhere uh, but I don't know where if they're at the hotel if they're in uh, down there with my wife and, and with a bunch of other messages which would have took too long to try to go through but uh, so I said okay Lord I've got other messages in my Bible and I'll just look through them real quick pick one of them and apparently I missed it. And the Lord said, no, you didn't miss it. So I'm preaching this. If it's not the way I normally preach, just forgive me. I'm going to have to go off memory. And my memory is not the best as it used to be. I've not preached this out at all. So it's not like it's rehearsed or memorized or remembered. I've got some messages I've preached enough that uh, the notes, not having the notes really wouldn't bother me that bad. This is not one of them. And uh, I am thankful I'm in a comfortable place that... Uh, hopefully y'all will forgive me if it's not the best. And then I was already nervous. Brother J.D. already told me how great Brother Sam did. Best message ever, probably ever been preached by a guest preacher ever in the history of First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. And then told me, Brother, well, let's preach it next week. And, and so I'm thinking, okay, great Sam Davidson, great Dr. R.B. Willette. And right in the middle, I told my wife today, and we had to, and the girls, uh, our older girls was with us. The other kids were with the house. And and I said, and we had to stop by Walmart a minute, and I made that comment, and my wife said, Honey, just think of me. I said, I'm sandwiched right between these two guys, and J.D. didn't put enough pressure on me. And then she said, Listen, what's the best part of the Oreo? <laughs> and that helped me. That encouraged me. <laughs> Until I got to the hotel, and I got to thinking how many times I grabbed an Oreo, and the cream had slipped out, and there wasn't nothing but two cookies. I hope that's not the case tonight. Amen. Amen. So I appreciate you and love you. I thank God for his goodness. Exodus chapter number four, you know the passage really well. Even if you may not know uh, all the story, we most of us are familiar enough with Moses. And God has called him, done a, an amazing work. I preached through the life of Moses some in Sunday school some time ago, and it's just amazing the lessons that can be learned out of the life of Moses, and I don't have time to get into it, even with his parents seeing that he was a goodly child and seeing even as a young child the touch of God and by faith believing God had something for him and how they raised him to the place that uh, a mama that nursed him for a short time put enough in him that when Moses made the decision of whether more than likely, according to commentators, to be the next Pharaoh of Egypt underneath Pharaoh uh, Moses decided to suffer with the people of God and with the reproach of them than the pleasures of Egypt. And that's an amazing thing 
that she put enough in him. And she put enough of his destiny knowing what God was going to do for him in the book of Acts. The Bible lets us in on some insight with Moses and, and tells us that Moses just thought the people ought to know he was going to be their leader. And so it's an amazing character study in the life of Moses. I want to pick up, and then, of course, chapter 3, uh, where the Lord appears in the burning bush. A lot of messages could be preached out of that. But here a while back, I, uh, was re I was praying one Sunday morning early and asking God for some things, and the Lord, in my prayer time, directed me to this chapter. And as I read this chapter, the Lord spoke to my heart. And I just want to share a simple thought with you tonight that I hope will be of some help. Exodus chapter number 4. Moses has been told by God that he wants him to deliver Israel. And we'll pick up in verse 1 of chapter 4. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. Moses is remembering back, Lord, I tried this 40 years earlier. I tried stopping two guys from killing each other, and they turned on me and, and then brought up that I killed an Egyptian and I had to run. And, and the difference is now we're in God's timing versus Moses' timing. But Moses is no doubt thinking back, and he said, They'll not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for, will they, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And I know there's been hundreds of messages preached, and I've not heard Brother Willett preach out of that, but I'm sure he's got one, and it's probably the best you'll ever hear anywhere. Uh, but what is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. He cast it on the ground and it become a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and called it. And it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. Now in the RU revival, I preached out of verse 5 on the, or, or dealt with that thought on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I'm interested in verse number 3 tonight where the Bible said, The Lord looks at Moses after asking him what he had and said, Cast it on the ground. And I want to use that thought tonight and deal really with the subject of faith in our life. Maybe your faith is what it needs to be. i be honest with you, four months ago, I would have told you that I had great faith. I would have told you that I, I say great. I would say I thought that I had decent faith. I thought that my faith was pretty good compared to a lot. I'd seen God do a lot of things and trusted Him for many things. But I, God showed me that it wasn't near as strong as I thought it was and used this passage to help deal with me about it. And I hope that it'll be a help to you. But I just want you to think with me for a moment. And again, I'm having to go off memory and I've got points and sub points and sub points of the sub points in my outline, but I don't have that tonight. But I think I know enough of the message and enough that's in my heart to be able to, to, to help us tonight. And I want you to notice the faith that God required in the life of Moses. The Lord looks at Moses. And again, if you know the story, Moses doesn't think much of himself. And Moses is arguing really with God about what he can do and how he can do it. And before we jump on Moses, may I say that in some time in your Christian life, if you've been saved any length of time at all, you may not have verbally done it, but you've argued with God as well. God wants something and you didn't give in, or God uh, deal with you an invitation and you didn't come, or uh, God said do this and you didn't do it, or God said give this and you didn't give it, or God said knock on that door and you found five reasons not to. We, In some form or fashion, we all have argued with God in, 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 at one time or another, and unfortunately probably way more than we ought to. And the Bible said that Moses said, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to listen to me. That's a fair statement, by the way. I mean, who was Moses? And Moses had been gone for 40 years. And Moses was a fugitive. And he was viewed as a murderer by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And, and why should they listen to him? And God said, Moses, what's, your, what's in your hand? I'll remind you, for the last 40 years, Moses has been a shepherd. 
By the way, it didn't strike me the irony that to the Egyptians, the shepherd was the lowest of the low of the low. God, Moses went from being second in command, probably, I believe, probably was going to take over for Pharaoh when he passed away to the worst position he could be in the eyes of an Egyptian. I preached on Father's Day Sunday morning, yes, Sunday morning on Joshua. Earlier that week, I'd been praying and reading and just my regular Bible reading and read through Joshua and, and, and read where, where Joshua in chapter 1, four times, God tells him to be strong and of good courage. And, 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 and four times God says that. And, and if God says it once, it's enough. But God says it three times, sorry. And then the fourth time, the people remind Joshua again. I thought, you know, I've never done a Father's Day message on Joshua. And, and, I, and then in Joshua 24, verse 15, he said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, and I got to looking at the life of Joshua and telling our men some things that they ought to be, ought be like in the life of Joshua. Joshua and one of the things was humility because Joshua the first time we meet him Moses looks at him and says hey how we've crossed the Red Sea and the Amalekites are coming and I want you to go and fight the Amalekites and 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 pick you some men in other words he must have been a, a, a military genius already must have already proved himself in the Egyptian army which they had Israelites fight in and so he must have already proved himself and Moses says hey Joshua pick you some men go fight the Amalekites and God gives a great victory to the place that when God's talking to Moses, God said, Moses, you get Joshua and rehearse what I've said and what happened and how I'm pleased with what's took place. The next time you find Joshua is several chapter later in Exodus and he's not a military chief. He's not a leader. He's not fighting a battle. The Bible says Moses is going up on the Mount Sinai to get the commandments from the Lord. And the Bible said that, that Joshua, the servant of Moses, he goes from a mighty war chief to a minister to a servant it takes humility to do anything of menial tasks but it takes a lot of humility to go from the top to the bottom and it's an amazing thing Moses got on the mount 40 days Joshua sets on that mount and never budges Moses own brother turns on him Aaron and all the people turn Joshua sets right there but Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will, or we will serve the Lord. He got the me right. There's a lot of great things in Joshua. The problem was I wanted to preach about how his kids turned out. And I, from, to my shame, 27 years of full-time ministry, I'd never really done a genealogical study on Joshua. And when I did, it was amazing. There's nothing mentioned about his wife, about his children. I went to Chronicles and I thought, well, that gives all the, the genealogies of the tribes and he's from the tribe of Ephraim. So I went to, I went to Chronicles and went to chapter number 7 and found Ephraim. And sure enough, I thought, okay, I'm going to at least get the kids' names. Hebrew names have meaning. Find out what their kids, his kids' names were and then see how they turned out based on what he did. It mentions Joshua and that's it. Stops. That's not my message, but I just will throw it out and then get back to my point. I'm not off point either. Joshua had a lot of good qualities. But my last point in my Father's Day message was he missed it. As for me and my house, we will. The word will, if you know your Bible, King James, and the English language is an amazing language. The word will means there is a choice, there's a desire, but it's a choice that you get to make. Shall is a demand. It's a stronger word. It means we're going to do it, no exception, no, 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 nothing about it. He didn't say we shall. He said we will. He got the me right, but the thing he missed it in, all them good qualities in Joshua died with Joshua. Israel went to pieces because Joshua never passed anything on to his family. Moses is a man that is what he is because a mom and dad said we see something in him and we're not going to let him turn loose and and although he's 40 years of age and been trained in the egyptian schools when he had to make a choice to suffer the reproach according to hebrews with israel or are to, to live in the pleasures of egypt he said i choose israel that's not just a credit to him that's a great credit to a mama that puts something in him 
Moses, what do you got in your hand? Well, Lord, I've got this rod, that staff is what I believe it was, that shepherd's staff, and, and he had had it for years, and that's what they used. Listen, that staff was very important to him. It was prominent in his life. It was something of, of value to him. It was something of great price to him. I mean, that's what he used to herd the sheep. That's what he would have used to discipline the sheep. That's what he would have used to correct them and to pull them and, and to help them. I mean, that rod was important. And God said, what do you got in your hand? A thousand messages could be preached on that. We've all got something in our hand that we can use. But what I'm interested in is once Moses said, okay, God, I've got the rod. The Lord said, throw it down. Cast it down. In other words, th what God is saying is, give it to me. Take your hand off of it. What is it tonight that God wants you to take your hands off of? God looks at all of us and says, I want you to cast some things down. You may need to cast uh, your family down. You know, it's amazing as a husband or as a, as a dad or as a mom or as a wife, we think that we're in control of our family or we're in control of how our kids turn out. Can I tell you the only way they're going to turn out is if you give them to God. The only way your marriage is going to turn out is if you give it to God. The only way a church is going to turn out is if you give it to God. And many times we get the idea if we hang on to it had that somehow it's going to be okay and Moses for 40 years had operated with this rod it was special it was significant listen it mattered to him but God said Moses if you want to get to the next level I want you to cast it down to cast it down means I got to take my control my authority my will my wants for that rod completely off and I got to put it down at the feet of God what is it that God wants you? Maybe it's your pocketbook. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your ministry. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe, I don't know what it may be. Maybe it's something in your life that needs to be cast down. But God looked at Moses and he said, cast it to the ground. Now that takes some faith. How many times have you talked to someone or preachers in here, you talk to someone and say, you just need to give it to God. Yeah, but if I give it to God, then, then what's he going to do? And, and what do we say? We always say God makes no mistakes and he doesn't. And God does everything right and he doesn't. And listen, God's going to do some great things. And you just got to get to the place that you can give it to God. There may be some bitterness in your life, anger in your life. I don't know what rods you may have, but God says to you and I, if we're going to be used of God and see the power of God and make a different in, in someone else's life. And by the way, this whole conversation is not about Moses. It's about Moses being used of God to help someone else. You know, we've missed it in the Christian life. We think it's about us. God didn't call you to preach for your sake. He called you to preach to help someone else. God didn't give you singers' voices for you to pat yourself on the back on how great you sing. He did it for you to help somebody else. God didn't give Brother Cowling the ability he's got with RU and, uh, and, and, and just the an innate ability to relate to people in a way not many could. And God didn't do that for him to say, I've got the greatest RU in the world, and I believe he does. He did it for him to help someone else. God didn't save you for you to sit on a pew and, and say, I'm a good Christian and I've got the right Bible. I'm sitting in a good church, one of the greatest churches around, and, and I've got a good pastor and I had a, for a good former pastor and, and everything God didn't do. Listen, it's not about you. Do we understand tonight everything God did in our life, he did for one reason, because he wants us to go help somebody else. The whole reason we exist is to make a difference in someone else's life. And I'm afraid even fundamental, independent, Bible-believing Baptists have got to the place that we think the Christian life's about us and about what we're doing and who we are. And I'm telling you tonight, we ought to live clean, we ought to live holy, all those things. But all of that is just so we can be in a position to be able to reach down to someone else and help them and make a difference in their life. And the quicker we get ourselves out of the way and the quicker we understand 
understand this whole work of Moses' life. Moses is content. Moses is happy. Moses is satisfied. He's got a wife. He's got boys. He's been there 40 years. He can stay there. He's adjusted. But this conversation, God said, Moses, I want to use you to make a difference in someone else. What do you need to cast down to take the next step to make a difference in someone else's life? It took some faith for him to throw that down and trust God with it. I want you to notice what happens. Okay, Moses, no doubt, I don't know that he struggled a whole lot. He had already seen the burning bush. He already knew he was talking to the God of heaven. He already knew that God was in charge. He had took off his shoes because he was on holy ground. And I have no doubt that Moses knows he's in the presence of God. But I'm sure it's probably just a little hint of, you know, but, but what's he going to do with it? And, and, well, you know, that's my rod and I need that thing. But, but he throws it down. I've talked to so many people over the years, and I say, you just need to give it to God. You say, well, I don't know how, or I'm afraid. No, it's not. Just throw it. Just take your hands off. I, I've talked to people with burdens, and, and I say, the Bible said, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And this is you say, they, they say, but I, I don't know how to do that. Just throw it. Do you know how to throw a ball? Do you know how to throw a, a paper airplane? Do you know how to throw a pencil? Just throw it. Just take your hands off. Take your control off of it, your mind off. Just throw it. Moses does that. He cast it. And over the years, the greatest thing I've heard from people is, but, but what if what if it don't turn out right? Come on now, you felt that way too. So Moses cast it. Did you notice our verse? He cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. I see not only faith, I see fear. I don't know about you, but I don't want what I'm throwing before God to become something I absolutely am scared to death of. I don't want nothing to do with the snake. You say, well, you shouldn't be scared. Uh, call it what you want. I don't want to. I, I think they're ugly. I think they're cursed. It's the only animal I can find, even the millennial rain, that still has the curse on it, still going to be, be slithering around on its belly instead of its former state. I, I don't want one as a pet. I don't want to touch one. I don't want to hold one. I just soon not run into one. And, and I don't even think a dead snake's a good snake. I, and in the Bible, a snake is always in the negative connotation. There's only one simple positive one, and it's when God says, for them when that curse come amongst the serpents and God said make a brazen serpent but even that was uh, with Christ a type of becoming our sin and if they that were bit look to that, that serpent that brazen serpent attack of Christ then they would be healed there is no good snake in your Bible none okay I'm going to give it to God preacher I'm going to give, I'm going to trust God and tithe. I'm going to trust God and go soul winning. I'm going to trust God and be at church every service. I'm going to trust God and read my Bible every day. I'm going to trust my kids to God and let them go to camp. I'm going to, whatever it may be, I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to throw it down. I'm going to trust Him with my bitterness, my anger, my burden, my trouble. I'm going to give it to Him, my ministry, my life. Okay, God, here it is. And what's God do? Boom. Snake. Most commentators say it's probably a cobra. What a blessing. <laughs> we read these Bible stories, but put yourself in Moses' position. Your rod, the thing that you just gave to God, he turned it into something that looks evil. He turns it into something that looks wrong. Well, preacher, I promised God, I know y'all just come out of missions month, and I promised God I'd give to missions, and, and I went to work, and they docked my pay. I, by faith, trusted God, and look how he's repaid me. I've lost $2 an hour. Ain't that how we do? I committed to read my Bible, and then the doctor said I'm going blind. 
I don't know what you've thrown to God in years gone by, but sometimes we cast it and God does something with it we never expected. God said, give it to me. Well, if we give it to him, is it not his to do what he wants with? If we give it to him, does he not make any mistakes? But I'm just saying from the human side, a snake, really God? I give you my rod? A snake? And before you criticize Moses, how many times have you gone to God and needing answers and needing help? And what you got in return was what you thought was a serpent. It looked like God wasn't being fair. It looked like God wasn't being just. It looked like God wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. I don't know what Moses thought. I don't know if he thought the rod was going to turn into a big cannon or if he thought it was going to turn into... I don't know what he thought. But I promise you he never dreamed it was going to become a snake. And how many times in our life have we given something to God only for God to do with it the complete opposite we thought he was going to do? I talked to someone here a while back. I say a while back, it's been in the last year. And they said, I've committed my spouse who's lost. They're saved. They got saved. Their, their spouse is lost. They said, preacher, I've, I've committed my spouse to God. I've let go. I've turned them over to them. I'm praying every day. I want to see God save them. God said to trust him. I'm trusting him. And that, that spouse has gotten meaner, gotten ornerier. And I don't know how much more I can take. You know what they're saying? I threw my rod to the ground and it become a snake. Why would God make it a snake? Why would God make it harder? I gave it to him, preacher, and it's harder. I trust him with my finances, and I lost my job. I trust him with my kids, and one messed up. I trust him with this. I'm saying tonight that God says sometimes in this one example of many in the Bible, that listen, God said do something, and they do it, and it didn't turn out the way they thought it was going to. Where do you see the fear? Because when it become a serpent, verse 3, Moses fled. That's where the fear comes in. You don't run from something you ain't scared of. What is it tonight you're afraid to cast? Afraid God won't do right with it? Well, preacher, you ain't helping me none because this just proves if I give it to him, it's going to become a snake and I don't want no snake. Well, let's see how it ends. I see the faith, I see the fear, I see the fleeing. When Moses sees that God didn't do with it what he thought he should do, Moses runs the opposite direction. Is that not like us? There's preachers in here that's preached for many years, brother, brother what pastor for me is, you know, and, and I've 27 years under my belt, many of these assistants have served long enough. I can't tell you over the years how many people I've seen that that God didn't do what they thought he should do, and they ran. They left church. They quit RU. They left the Sunday school class. They quit soul winning because they didn't see no one saved the first four times they went. They quit tithing because they didn't see God drop $20 million in their lap in the first month they tithed, and so it doesn't work, and, and it didn't do what Benny Hinn said it would do, so therefore it must not be real. We laugh. I read my Bible. I needed something from God. The preacher said if I ran, God would feed me. And I didn't get nothing out of it, so I'm not reading it. I prayed. And God didn't answer. So you quit praying. You know what we're really saying? We're saying I gave it to God. I cast it. But God ain't doing with it what I thought. So I'm going to run away. Well, if Moses would have ran away, what would he have had? Nothing. Everything God was going to do with Moses is tied back there at that rod that's now become a snake. And Moses either deals with it or he misses out. What are you running from tonight? What are you scared to face? 
What sin in your life are you trying to just avoid instead of deal with? What, what situation in your life? What struggle in your life? What storm in your life? What is it that God's disappointed you in? If we were to interview Moses at this moment, he would say, I don't know what God's doing, but I want no part of it. That's a snake. How do you know, preacher? Because that's what I'd be saying. Well, I want you to watch. I see faith. I see fear. I see fleeing. Now I see more faith. Verse 4, Moses is running. Now, I want you to get this scene. It's almost comical. He throws the rod down. Now, I can't prove this, but if you flee, I looked up the word flee. It means to turn and run. So I don't believe he ran by the snake. I'm pretty safe in assuming with the definition of the word and common sense, if you're running from something, you go the opposite direction of what it is. So here's the rod. Here's the snake. Here's Moses. And the flea means to go very quickly. He wasn't just walking. He's running. I don't know how far he got. Somewhere in there, God, I can just see Moses running. I'm done. I'm out of here. Moses. Uh, yeah, God. Stop. But God, it's a snake. I trusted you. I believed you. I did what you asked, and it ain't turned out the way I thought it should. God, I'm done. Moses, stop. Well, I'm far enough away from that thing. If it comes near me, God, I'm running. Okay, what do you want, God? Go catch it. Look at verse 4. Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. How do you know he's a little way from it? He put forth his hand and caught it. Moses has to, God says, Moses, that thing you're scared of, that thing that you don't think I'm doing right in, that thing that you think is not going to work out, I want you to quit running, quit fleeing, turn around, go back to it and grab it. I would have never made it as Moses. And not only grab it. From what I understand from snake people, I talk to them, I don't like none of them. <laughs> from what I understand is you don't grab a snake by the tail. Unless you're very experienced and have a rod to grab a hold of the head. You grab it behind the head so it can't bite you. Um, the God of heaven, the God of all glory, the one that created it. Moses, quit running. Just stop, turn around, go back, pick it up by the tail. Um, God, I don't know what you had planned, but I'm perfectly fine. Have a good life. I'm out of here. We know he's scared. He's running. But he had enough faith in God to turn around. He has to catch that thing. He's not only got to pick it up, he's got to catch it. That means a snake feels defensive. A defensive snake will strike you. And not only will he strike you, he looks at you. And Moses has got to position himself to grab him by the tail. God! I know you're the God of all, but have, uh, am I hearing another voice? This is nuts. Pick it up, Moses. Trust me. I believe the greatest sin in the life of Christians is our lack of faith. Oh, we could talk about fleshly sins. We could talk about failures. We could talk. I, I get all that. But I'm telling you, I believe the greatest sin 
amongst Christians. And one of the greatest grievances of God in this Bible is lack of faith. Want to know why you don't pray? Little faith. Boil it down all you want. Make any excuse you want. What it boils down, if you really believe God's the God of all gods and he has all power and can answer every prayer you pray and can give you, you would pray. Want to know why you don't read your Bible every day? Faith. Want to know why you're not faithful to church? Faith. Want to know why you don't give and give abundantly and give exceedingly and just see how much you... Faith. Faith failures. And, and, and we could turn to Psalm 78 and we could turn to, to Hebrews and, and we could listen. Even Samson, I, I'm amazed that Samson made it in, in the hall of faith. But the little bit that he had, as wrong as he was, he had faith that impressed God. And God said, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'm saying to you and I tonight, God says to us, you want to see great things. You want to see me use you. You want to see your life expanded? You got to go grab that snake by the tail, Moses. What is it tonight God wants? And you're looking at it. You give it to him, but you're looking at it. Say, I don't see how this can ever, how can this be bad? This is bad. This ain't good. And God says, just trust me. What directions has he given you? That makes no sense. Moses goes to the snake. More of a man than I would be. Picks it up. I mean, he don't know what God's going to do at this point. God's turned his rod into a snake, telling him he could think God's just going to kill him because he's been arguing with him. But he picks it up. And the Bible said that when he picked it up by the tail... He put forth his hand and called it, and it became a rod in his hand. This point on, that rod is no longer the rod of Moses. This point on, that rod become the rod of God in Moses' hand. I want to be used of God, preacher. I want a better prayer life. I want to be a soul winner. I want to be a better preacher. I want to be a better church member. I want to be a better husband, a better mother, a better wife, a better child. A, whatever it is tonight that you are trying to... Th I want to fix that sin in my life. I want to straighten this out. My Whatever it is tonight, there's only one way it's going to come about. It's when you take your hands completely off of it and God gets you completely out of the way. And you obey God to the letter and how he says for you to handle it. God will take you and do great things with you. This rod that Moses looked at and said, it's a snake, it's evil, it's bad, I'm running, I don't want nothing to do with it. Open the Red Sea. This rod brought forth water from the rock. This rod led millions of Israelites through a tough, difficult situation. All because Moses had enough faith to say, God, I'll do it your way and not mine. Proverbs 3 says this, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. God says to us over and over and over and over, I'm looking for somebody to do great things with. But you've got to trust me. What do you need to cast down? What do you need to pick up tonight? I had a lot of other material, but that's what God said give. I can't speak for you. I can speak for, as for me and my house. This shutdown, lockdown, virus, God's taught me a lot of things about faith. 
one of the lessons he's taught me is I need a lot more of it. And what he's taught me is if my desire is really to help somebody else, if it's really to be what Christianity is all about, which is me out of the way and others, then I got to do it his way. Whether I understand it, whether I agree with it, whether it makes sense, whether it's scary, whether it's fearful, whether I feel like running. And I'm telling you, I see a lot of Christians running from God. Oh, they may sit in a church, but they're running. They won't teach that class. They won't work that bus route. They won't knock on that door. They won't get in the choir. They won't play that instrument. They, they won't. Scared. What is it tonight that God's saying to you? Would you just cast it? Can I promise you this? I can't promise you that when you first give it to him, it's going to look the way you think it ought to. It may look horrible. It may scare you to death. You may look at it and say, there is no way, God, that I can do that. But if you'll just do it his way, what I can promise you on the authority of that Bible is that it will work out right. And that you will be better off doing it his way than any other way you try to do it. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. What do you need to cast tonight? I'm going to pray with you and let the pastor give the invitation. He said I could, but I feel like he may know you. I don't know. He does know you way better than I. But if God spoke to your heart tonight, pianist I thought was supposed to be playing, if they want to come on. And if God spoke to your heart, would you just find your place on the altar in your pew and just say, God, I submit. Preacher, how, how do I give it to him? Just throw it. Just let go of it. That's how. I don't know how to make it more simple. Faith is simply me letting go and trusting someone else with it. Some are coming. Would you just let God speak to you? God sent me from Virginia through summer preaching. God, church, I love you. I love this place. But I'm just asking you tonight. I don't want to just be a fill-in. I don't want to just take up space. I want to help you. And I can tell you in my life, God has told me, just cast it. Cast it. Father, use the invitation. Lord, I, I believe I've preached exactly what you want to preach. Now, you do the work. It's not in my words. It's not in my wisdom. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that you take the feeble things that's been said and anoint them and empower them and use them for the glory of God. Touch the message. Touch this place. May your will be done in the invitation. In Jesus' name.